Y chromosomes in chimps and humans. <coughs> and I quote, the common chimp, pan troglodytes, and human Y chromosomes are horrendously different from each other, says David Page of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is of course the home of Harvard and MIT. Horrendously different. Isn't that an interesting adjective to describe scientific facts? That comes from the fickle Y chromosome. Chimp genome reveals rapid rate of change, which is an article in Nature News, uh, pardon me, nature.com uh, slash news. And uh, they're referring to an article that was written by a multiple people, paper in Nature, Hughes, J.F. et al. Um, the last et al. happens to be uh, uh, David Page. Chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are remarkably divergent in structure and gene content. And um, there's the address of the Nature article itself. If you don't have a subscription to Nature and don't want to pay all the money, um, part of it is posted, I'm pretty sure not all of it, but a good share of it is published, uh, is posted at that address. You have to go and download the PDF at that point. Um, <coughs> anyway, to uh, give you some background as to why human and chimp uh, Y chromosomes are horrendously different, um, I need to give you some expectations that were uh, believed at one point. Uh, the rest of the genome, as most of you know, is supposed to be 99% similar. Well, maybe 98, maybe 95. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's some estimates that are reasonable that will say 70%, but it depends on how you count things, whether you count things that slide around and so forth. Um, but uh, as we'll see, there's quite a bit of similarity. Um, Many reptiles, interestingly, are sexed by heat. That means that if you're a turtle, if you're cool, you're a male. If you're hot, you're a female. On the other hand, if you're a lizard, if you're cool, you're a female. If you're hot, you're a male. Um, and then there are apparently alligators that if you're in the middle temperature, you're a male. If you're cooler or hotter, then you're female. Uh, very odd uh, way of doing sex, you would think. But um, the theory is that the sex chromosomes originally came from autosomal, regular old chromosomes. That being the case, the Y is smaller than the X, so the male chromosome is apparently a, degenerative, a degenerate female chromosome. That's the standard theory. And um, let me just give you a little um, uh, further. Since the Y chromosome cannot cross over, except for very small parts at the ends, with any other chromosome, um, there's a little bit of crossover with the X at the very ends, there is no way of correcting it. So. Once it's there, it's there. If it mutates, it mutates, and uh, you hope it isn't the one that fertilizes the egg, because if it does, then the, the male will have a defective Y chromosome. Bad genes get to hitchhike on good genes. Um, now, one is tempted to say, what do you mean by good genes? Well, you know, genes that make the male more um, uh, productive, shall we say, in the environment. Well, what kind of genes are those? Well, uh, are those genes that have extra special enzymes in them? Uh, probably not, because it's hard to create an enzyme. They're more likely to be genes that have a particular enzyme that is defective in some way, but the defect happens to be advantageous in the environment. Um, but in any case, uh, you have uh, bad genes that can come along for the ride, um, and Assuming common ancestry, the Y chromosome has grown smaller. As you can see, um, the X chromosome, which we colored pink in this particular illustration, um, 
is quite a bit larger than the Y. And in fact, we're going to find it has a lot more enzymes in it, uh, uh, genes that code for enzymes in it. So uh, to go to science news to set the stage again, the Y chromosome has long been thought of as a stagnant part of the genome where genes are slowly decaying in males of all species. They don't get renewed by this crossover stuff. Uh, for almost a century, researchers have thought that the Y chromosome with far fewer genes than the X was decaying. Both sex chromosomes evolved from an ordinary pair of chromosomes more than 200 million years ago. That's the standard story. And that, of course, um, <coughs> is from Science News, and the address is there. Um, but since then, the Y has steadily lost genes as well as its ability to recombine and swap genes with the X chromosome. This suggested that the Y has long been an isolated chromosome with little left to lose, just a couple of hundred genes at most, whose job is to produce sperm and determine the sex of the offspring. As a result, the researchers predicted that the Y chromosome should be nearly identical in humans and chimpanzees, like the rest of the genome. You see, it's been decaying for all this time, and there's not much left to decay. Um, a comment by Forbes magazine, I'm sorry it's not, but it is a science editor, and he's quoting Page. He, Page, thought, found that the human X chromosome contains only 19 of the 600 genes it once shared with the X chromosome. So if you're into common ancestry, this is the, you know, 600, you have now down to less than 20. About one-thirtieth of what you used to have. And there's the address for those of you who want to look at it. And to come in Nature News, which again is uh, the common chimp, pan troglodytes, and human Y chromosomes are horrendously different from each other, said David Page of the Whitehead Institute, who led the work. It looks like there's been a dramatic renovation or reinvention of the Y chromosome in the chimpanzee and human lineage. Whoa. That's the news. And um, now we're going to go to the Nature article itself. Our laboratory has previously demonstrated that the human MSY euchromatin is largely composed of two sequence classes, amplicanic and X-degenerate. Now, X-degenerate is simply used to be in the X and um, mostly gone now. Amplicanic is got these amplicons, and we're going to find a little bit more about them later. We find that the same two species classes dominate the chimpanzee MSY. That's the male-specific Y. In other words, they're not talking about the ends that can actually cross over. They're just talking about the part that doesn't. Um, euchromatin. And thus, the same was likely true in the common ancestor. Well, that makes sense. I mean, if you've got you know, evidence for it in one lineage, then it probably was in the common ancestor. If you've got a common ancestor, that is. The amplicanic segments are composed of large, nearly identical repeat units, most often arrayed as palindromes. Well, what's a palindrome? ABBA is a palindrome. A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. Otto, O-T-T-O. -T -T -O. Where you have spellings that can be turned around and they're the same. So these are giant pieces of DNA that have this spelling here and then they get to the middle and then they have the same spelling in reverse on the other side. Well actually the reverse spelling in reverse but whatever. Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so palindromes uh, and they harbor multi-copy gene families expressed predominantly or exclusively in the testis. By contrast, the X-degenerative segments are dotted with single-copy homologs of X-linked genes. These single-copy MSY genes, most of which are expressed ubiquitously, are surviving relics of ancient autosomes from which the X and Y chromosomes evolved. Together, the amplicanic and X degenerative uh, degenerate sequences comprise the bulk of the male specific Y euchromatin in both chimpanzees and humans. 
a third sequence class in the human MSY euchromatin, the X transposed sequences, has no counterpart in the chimpanzee MSY. Wait a minute. How do you tell the difference between X transposed and X degenerative? Well, you don't. What you have to do is you have to go back to the rhesus monkey which inherited or perhaps to some further ancestor and say, well, this wasn't in all of the common ancestors, but it got included in the human. So it must have come from the X chromosome fresh. You see how much of this is laden with theory. Has no counterpart in the chimpanzee MSY. And no counterpart anywhere else either, by the way. Does X cross with Y? Does it add genes to Y? Or is this a design feature? Well, has um, the presence of these sequences in the human MSY is the result of an X to Y transposition that occurred in the human lineage after it's divergent from the chimpanzee lineage. So we have, we have things that look for all the world like X degenerative, except that they're present in humans and nowhere else. Um, I'm obviously not reading this thing straight through. Given that primate sex chromosomes are hundreds of millions of years old, I should have that too should be above the line. Theories of decelerating decay would predict that the chimpanzee and human MSY should have changed little since the separation of these two lineages just six million years ago. That's the prediction. To test this prediction, we aligned and compared the nucleotide sequences of the chimpanzee and human MSYs. As expected, we found that the degree of similarity between orthologous chimpanzee and human MSY sequences, that's like 98 0.3% identity differs only modestly from that reported while comparing the rest of the chimpanzee and human genomes. So when they match, they match pretty good. Surprisingly, however, greater than 30% of chimpanzee MSY sequence has no hom homologous alignable counterpart in the human MSY and vice versa. It's like they're brand new chromosomes in that respect. In this respect, the MSY differs radically from the remainder of the genome, where less than 2% of chimpanzee euchromatic, euchromatic sequences uh, lacks a homologous alignable counterpart in humans and vice versa. We conclude that since the separation of the chimpanzee and human lineages, sequence gain and loss have been far more concentrated in the MSY than in the balance of the genome. You go from like 98% to suddenly less than 70%. Despite the chimpanzee MSY's elaborate structure, its gene repertoire is considerably smaller and simpler than that of a human MSY. As a result of gene loss in the chimpanzee lineage and gene acquisition in the human lineage. Well, how do you know it's gene loss and gene acquisition? Well, it's because you're comparing it with other uh, Y chromosomes. If they're separate created kinds, then of course uh, you're just saying that they're, they're dissimilar. And the chimpanzees have less than humans. For example, we previously discovered that the chimpanzee X degenerate regions had lost four of the 16 genes through inactivating mutations. While the human X degenerative regions had lo not lost any genes since the time of the last common ancestor. We also reported that two X transposed genes in the human MSY had been acquired since the time of the last common ancestor. So what they're saying is there are six genes in humans that are not there in chimps. Which raises an interesting question. If they're not necessary in chimps, are they necessary in humans? And if so, or if not, what was the selective pressure to keep them in humans? We did discover that within the Ampliconic regions, 
Three of nine multi-copy testis expressed gene families present in humans have been mutationally disabled or are simply absent in, hum in chimpanzees. For example, the chimpanzee MSY contains five loci homologous to the human K part XKRY fam gene family, but all five copies share a frame shift mutation that severely truncates the open reading frame and predicted protein. It's like somebody went in there and damaged those things. We confirmed the presence of this disabling mutation in five additional chimpanzee and two bonobos. Close relatives of the common chimpanzee data not shown. Boy, I'd really like to get hold of that data. They've actually been doing bonobos and chimpanzees and their Y chromosomes. Be fascinating to look at them for ourselves. Similarly, the HSFY and PRY gene families are well represented in the human MSY, but absent from the chimpanzee MSY. Now, here it's not a frame shift mutation, as far as I can tell from reading that. It's just gone. While it is unclear whether the PRY family was gained in the human lineage or lost in the chimpanzee limit, lineage, you see, the theory doesn't really tell you that uh, until you've got some other Y chromosome to compare it with. Um, the presence of HSFY in the CAT25, rhesus macaque, and bull MSYs, HS personal communication, leads us to conclude that this gene family was deleted outright in the chimpanzee lineage. So apparently the chimpanzee just had those genes just kind of ripped out. In aggregate, the consequence of gene loss and gain is in respectively the chimpanzee and human lineage is that the chimpanzee MSY contains only two-thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human MSY, and only half as many protein coding transcription units. By contrast, in the remainder of the, the remainder of the genome, comparison of chimpanzee draft sequence with human reference sequence suggests that the gene content of the two species differs by less than one percent. Indeed, at six million years of separation, the difference in MSY gene content in chimp chimpanzee and human is more compatible to the difference in autosomal gene content in chicken and human. The Y chromosome is as if we're as closely related to a rooster as we are to a male chimp. We have conducted the first comprehensive comparison of Y chromosome from two species, providing an empirical insight into Y chromosome evolution and a test of decelerating decay theories. These theories elegantly account for the de degeneration observed in neo-Y chromosomes recently evolved from autosomes, so the theory works for other places. However, they did not predict and cannot account for the rapid divergence of the older highly evolved chimpanzee and human MSY is described here. This does not make evolutionary sense. Instead, remodeling and regeneration have dominated chimpanzee and human MSY evolution during the past six million years. There has to have been a lot of evolution going on, way more than anybody expected. We suggest that this renovation involving both architecture and genetic repertoire was propelled by a combination of factors acting in synergy. Three of these factors distinguish the evolving hominid MSY from the bulk of the genome. One, the highly disproportionate role of MSY genes, especially ampliconic gene families, in sperm production. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of selective pressure. Two, the brisk kinetics of ectopic recombination and resultant structural change in ampliconic regions. There must have been a lot of recombination. Well, there had to be, because otherwise, how can you get that divergence of chimp and human DNA from the same original ancestor? There had to be, but could there have been that much? And three, the absence of crossing over with the homologue, which creates the opportunity for a single advantageous mu mutation to dictate the MSY's evolutionary fate or what they call genetic hitchhiking. Okay, so 
The evolutionary impact of these three MSY features was likely multiplied by sperm competition, especially in the lineage of the modern chimpanzee, where multiple males mate with the same female at each estrus. This heightened sperm competition in the chimpanzee lineage, along with positive selection and hitchhiking effects, may account for greater MSY sequence ap amplification than in the human MSY, and extensive gene loss compared with little or none in the human MSY. So, in the future, complete Y chromosome sequences from additional species will shed further light on these hypotheses. I'll say they will. It'd be very interesting to see. Well, here's a drawing of the two, and you can see that you have a completely different structure of the two genes, including lots and lots and lots of this heterochromatic stuff and very little of that in the chimp. Now, you see this uh, YQ? That's one of the places it can cross over. There's a YP that it can cross over, and there's a YQ that it can cross over. And the rest of it, it doesn't cross. The MSY, the male-specific region, covers almost all of the gene. So they're completely disorganized. Well, let me show you what, if you were to line up human and chimpanzee chromosome 21, you'll notice that you get an almost straight line. Now, if you look very carefully, you can see that there's a few little things that are out, you know, that have been moved from one to the other, um, but not very many. Most of this is pretty well lined up. That's the way everybody thought it's supposed to be. It makes sense, you know. Most of the genome stays the same. A few genes are moved from here to there. Well, this is the Y chromosome. Totally different. You'll notice that there's, you know, some of it does line up. Some of it's in backwards. Some of it's palindromic, so you get an X match. There's a whole area right here where uh, nothing in the human matches the chimpanzee. There's a whole area here where nothing in the chimpanzee matches the human. Yeah. Yes? Can you just go back to the last slide? That, uh, that um, one? Yeah. How did they get percentage sequence shared that high when the diagrams look so different? Do they, they don't have to be, they just pick up any, any similarity whatsoever? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter where it is. Doesn't matter where it is. You see, if, uh, let's go back to this one now. Uh, if you look at this, that's a similarity. And it'll be scored as 95, 98%, whatever, you know. It's backwards, but it's similar. Uh, this will be scored as a similarity. This will be scored as a similarity. That will be scored as a similarity. Mm -hmm. And so if you add all those little regions together, you get maybe 70%, maybe not quite. But as you can see, it's totally disorganized. How do they expect any survival value through this process? Um, you're asking the wrong questions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, very sorry. <laughs> to go back to Nature News, even the portions that do line up have undergone erratic relocation. In the only other chromosome, uh, to have been sequenced to the same degree of completeness in both species, chromosome 21, the authors found much less rearrangement. You could see that. I mean, it, it just, it pops out at you. It doesn't require a great deal of intelligence to figure that out. If you're marching along the human chromosome 21, you might as well be marching along the chimp chromosome 21. It's like an unbroken piece, piece of glass, said Page. But the relationship between the human and chimp Y chromosomes has been blown to pieces. 
Now you know why he called it horrendously different. Again, to Nature News uh, article, the, as the earlier studies have, had suggested, many of the stark changes between the chimp and human Y chromosomes are due to gene loss in the chimp and gene gain in the human. Page's team found that the chimp Y chromosomes has been only two thirds as many, has, has only two thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human Y chromosome and only 47% as many protein coding elements as humans. The remainder of the chimp and human genomes are thought to differ by gene number uh, by less than 1%. That's your familiar 99% chimp. Um, Obviously, it doesn't work with the Y chromosome. Now, trying to put all that together, right? It looks like the human and chimp Y chromosomes have been evolving like crazy, right? So, the natural, logical conclusion from that is that you'd think this much evolution between chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes, that human Y chromosomes must be markedly different from each other as well, right? I mean, the, the evolution didn't stop, <coughs> did it? Um, much more than other chromosomes, right? Right? One would be wrong. Let me introduce you to something that just came out this year, 2014. And for those of you who want it, it's on PLOS, so the whole article is available online. Under central, simple neutral models, he's setting this up, with constant and equal male and female population society, uh, sizes, diversity is expected to be proportional to the relative number of each chromosome in the population. X diversity is expected to be three quarters autosomal diversity. We're going to take a standard family of two um, because there are three X chromosomes, two in the female and one in the male, for every four chromosomes everything, everywhere else. Okay, and both the Y and MT mitochondrial DNA would, because there's only one of each, uh, diversity would be expected to be one quarter of the autosomal dis diversity, right? Makes sense. Okay, the Y chromosome does not undergo homologous recombination except in the small pseudo autosomal regions. In general, diversity is reduced in genomic regions or genomes with little or no recombination. Uh, similarly, previous studies of small segments of the human Y chromosome have found low levels of genetic diversity, but multiple theories ex exist to explain this reduction. Okay, here, using genome wine analysis of X, Y, and autosomal and mitochondrial DNA in combination with extensive population genetic simu simulations, we show that Low observed Y chromosome variability is not consistent with a purely neutral model. It isn't one-fourth. Well, how much is it? Well, let's get to that. Instead, we show that models of purifying selection with background selection affecting linked neutral sites are consistent with observed Y diversity. Further, the number of sites estimated to be directly under purifying se selection greatly exceeds the number of Y linked coding sites suggesting the importance of the highly repetitive ampliconic regions. In other words, all those things that are not genes are being selected for. Well, at least they're more identical than what we expect. Suggesting the importance, uh, because the functional significance of the ampliconic regions is poorly understood, our findings should motivate further research in this area. We don't know what's going on help. Previous analysis of portions of the Y reported low Y diversity. So this is no surprise. But measuring divergence normalized pi per site at 0 0.0018 for Africans and 0 0.0024 for Europeans. We observed that chromosome-wide Y diversity is an order of magnitude lower than the equilibrium neutral expe expectation of one quarter of the autosomal uh, level of diversity. As a matter of fact, it looks to me like it's two orders of magnitude, although maybe there's some kind of mul multiplicative effect that, that does it. 
Conversely, mitochondrial diversity is not reduced compared to expectation under neutrality. So the mitochondria are doing just every, what everybody else is doing. So remember this why that has changed horrendously between humans and chimps suddenly froze. And it changes much less than the autosomes. Way less. No comments about the tension between the lower rates of mutation in humans and the higher rates of divergence between humans and chimpanzees can be found in that article. Nor, if you look it up in Wikipedia, will you find any comments about the problem. But there's a problem there. It's not evolving now, but it has evolved way more rapidly than any other uh, any other gene or any other chromosome. It just stopped. Looks like creation. One of those, I don't know, those people, they always come up with that. Um, <clears throat> Creationist articles notice uh, the difficulties raised by the Y chromosome, of course, and uh, you'll find uh, some comments on it, although I haven't seen anybody that asked the question, why is the Y not moving now when it's moved so fast in the past? I've not seen anybody ask that question. Um, Answers Research Journal has an interesting article, uh, and Jeff Tompkins is doing... Um, uh, some different stuff and and uh, that was the the last um, article um, if you go back here that this this is uh, Tompkins article right there um, and his he has an interesting graph where he has taken uh, chimpanzee and human and and taken 100 base or 300 base or 850 base segments and gone through it and say where does it match and so forth and how, how closely does it match and he's getting matches down around 70 percent. I would really like somebody who knows stuff well and has the time to do it to go through and find out why his methodology gives you 70 percent when the standard methodology is supposed to give you 98 percent or whatever. But it, it, even with his matching, you can see that the Y chromosome goes way down to, in his case, under 40%. Now, my own view on this, from a naturalistic perspective, chimpanzee and hu, uh, human Y chromosomes are, as the guy said, horrendously different. They make no sense. It's horrible if you're a naturalist. Of course, if you're not a naturalist, you might say uh, pleasantly different. Uh, the difference does not make sense, and it especially does not make sense when compared to the slow evolution of the human Y chromosomes in real time that we can document. Perhaps the difference is designed. Um, now, What's fun is to stop looking down at what everybody's done so far and look up at what we might expect in the future. Predictions that could be made. Bonobos and chimps, remember, are probably the same species. It would be very interesting to see if their Y chromosomes don't diverge as much. Now, they're supposed to have diverged somewhere between one and three million years ago, depending on whose uh, scheme you're looking at. But this horrendously different, if it's been, you know, pretty constant, you'd expect it to be, uh, to, for them to be like uh, maybe 5% different. It'd be interesting if they are actually like zero, you know, 1% different or perhaps even matching the human divergence, that would argue for a very interesting uh, mutational pattern unless 
human Y chromosome was specifically created. Now what would be also interesting is to check the interspecies variation between chimps. What about different chimps? Do they have the same male chimps? Do they have the same close connection that humans do with the low? And if that's the case, doesn't that put some strain on this massive evolution that's taking place? Might be interesting to see what gorillas do. They might have low variation in Y chromosomes. Supposing gorillas and chimps matched each other and neither one of them matched humans. Oh, now, I don't know if that's true, but it would be interesting to check. Do mountain gorillas versus the lowland gorillas? It would be interesting, as long as we're at it, to check on horses, zebras, donkeys, wolves, foxes. Interestingly, some mice have completely lost or were designed without, I don't know which, a Y chromosome. Um, how, how do mice do in terms of divergence? Be interesting. There's a lot of research there. And I suggest that it's something that a creationist might find a great deal of interest in. Because to my mind, science is about making predictions and then testing them. And it's as much fun to make the predictions as it is to test them. But um, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comments, questions? I'll, uh, I'll ask a question. Sure. Since this is way outside of any training I had, my <laughs> college zoology and biology goes back 40 years now. We barely talked about DNA then, so. Anyway, um, most of us are interested in the theistic applications and what are some options within Adventism of explaining both differences? You've made it very clear there's a huge chasm of differences. But when we do have similarities, what are some of the options that we can use to help us along the way? Well, supposing you're designing an organism, you're kind of stuck with a lot of things that got to be similar. For example, you're going to probably use the Krebs cycle for everything. Okay, So all of the enzymes that go with the TCA cycle are going to have to be there. And they're going to have to be relatively similar. I mean, you change them too much and they don't do the job they're supposed to. Um, uh, if, if, you're, if you're designing an organism, the closer the organism is designed to another organism, the more you'd expect the genetics to be the same. Um, we have to be careful about making simplistic assumptions. You know, somebody made this simplistic assumption that the Y chromosome should be the same because it's inherited. Obviously, that assumption did not pan out. Um, but, uh, but that's part of science is to look for those things. And then it is to say what you see and to draw appropriate conclusions, at least tentative ones, since we in science never get to make absolute conclusions. Um, I think that it's interesting. Uh, let me put it this way. How many of you before today had heard of this study? Which one? You mean uh, the, the, the latest one? The, the, well, let's start with the 2014 study. How many of you had heard of the 2010 study? Okay, we've got one. 
somebody who reads the literature fairly extensively. This kind of stuff is not brought out. <sighs> the image we have of science is not an unbiased image. Think about that. <laughs> the next time somebody tells you the evidence is overwhelming. Well, the evidence that they want you to see is overwhelming. You would think this is important material. It doesn't get out there. Now, that's as much our fault as it is theirs, because we should be making a big deal about that. I'm trying to correct that a little bit. I let it go for four years. I didn't, uh, well, I didn't realize how powerful it was until I got into the article. But, you know, you look at those two, the, the chromosome 21 that matches incredibly well, and then the chromosome Y is just all mm -hmm. over the place. Yes? Uh, just one question here. Uh, haven't the evolutionists got themselves a little bit in trouble here uh, by their own uh, paradigm application, if I can put it uh, gently, of suggesting that 99 percent or 98 percent, the figures wouldn't be as striking if they hadn't pushed that figure, which is highly questionable. You mean if they accepted 95 percent, it wouldn't? Well, or 70 percent, you know. It, uh, yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be quite as striking as it's a case where uh, they've kind of pushed themselves in the box here to a certain extent. At least the box is a little stronger uh, because of what they did there, which was not sound. I think you're right. I have another comment. As Brother John's brought out, uh, uh, this is not in my background of training either. Uh, and you speak of how can we communicate this to, uh, to the, you know, the populace and to bring this out. I think uh, we really need to see from science, scientists, uh, more of a simplification of this even right here, <laughs> I speak for myself. Uh, it was very hard to really follow and understand really the, the meaning and the significance of point by point as you went over this. I speak for myself. I, I think you have a, a valid point there. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going through an editorial process of an article I've written for a journal, and uh, I, I want to uh, describe a difficulty we have here. It is extremely hard to simplify science and be honest and fair and rightly represent the picture, because that is not the reality, and you run into that. Editors are very anxious, you know, to uh, have you simplify it so people can understand it and so on and when you do it you almost have to sacrifice integrity which is it gets you into very serious problems uh, with uh, the editorial process I don't have a simple solution to your, your your problem that you mentioned is very real it's extremely real there but folks reality is complex and you can't always simplify it and be truthful maybe I can um help in one aspect of that, and that is that some of this is for people who do have some training in the area, who needed to see, you know, some of the background material. And not all of it will be understood by everybody. I hope that the picture of the t way the two chromosomes lined up uh, probably is simple enough to be understood by, you know, anybody with a reasonable training in, in graphs. Uh, and perhaps that's the, uh, uh, 
we are making a compromise and, and uh, some of it I'm trying to emphasize that there's a little bit of complexity in there. But on the other hand, I'm trying to also give you enough of an overall picture to where you can, you can see the, the forest for the trees. Uh, comment here and then I think one up there. Yeah, just let me add this comment. This is a clear case we have here this morning, a very clear case and so on. Uh, we're not always uh, that comfortable with creation uh, when it comes to uh, the fossil sequence or radiometric dating. We're uh, not uh, not as comfortable position. So uh, let's keep the total picture in mind here and keep our humility. Uh, but uh, this is this is a really a strong case that has been uh, needs to be needs to be. Uh, propagated uh, uh, in terms of uh, what is being portrayed and what, what is the real picture. Um, two thoughts. Um, there's not enough similarity to even have linear regression. I mean, there's, in your graph, did you it, try? It'd be interesting to try an R value. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And the, the question I have is, do you, Paul Geem, believe in a common ancestor? Uh, frankly, no. I, you know, I, I, I use that as kind of the background assumption that people make. Um, mm. But it, it looks to me like, a, God, when he made Adam, had to do a total rearrangement of DNA, if not a total recreation, in a different uh, light. So, uh, I don't even... And some of this stuff is, you know, the chromosome 21 matches pretty well. It's doing its job, why change it? Are there any trisomy 21 monkeys? I don't know the answer to that. They'd probably call them, probably call them up syndrome if they were, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Let me comment back here. I come from Washington, D.C., and we know a politician's lying when his lips are moving. <laughs> and how many times, uh, if we were to ask this group, do you believe politicians? There's nobody here would say, yes, I believe them. You know, for evidence proves that. And I, I'm not looking at it from either party's point of view. But you know, read the bill, uh, pass it first, and then worry about it later. Uh, I've been reviewing science textbooks for the last 40, 50 years. And I've watched what was kind of a suggestion 40, 50 years ago is now scientific proven, let's don't even debate it. And the assumptions made in modern biology textbooks are totally unsupportable. But if you ask, can you prove that, then somehow you're, you're, you're not an intellectual and you shouldn't be teaching in our classes. So we have to be very careful as we approach it. Now, I like uh, some of the other people here, I'm, I'm not a geneticist. Occasionally I pass the genome labs in Washington, D.C. That's about as close as I get to this subject. But the world in which I live is evidence of God's design and God's love, perverted as it may be today. But I think that somehow young people and many in the Adventist church just accept what they read without a, shall we say, a scientific approach to the biology textbooks that we use in our classes. Comment back there. I'd like to piggyback on what he just said. I believe that when you give a textbook, <coughs> excuse me, to a student in high school or in college, <coughs> what you've given them is the truth. And if you don't know that, then you're going to flunk on the next test. Mm -hmm. because, and because we teach that way, that the textbook is right and the textbook is the truth, we continue to perpetuate error 
through the textbooks. Yes. And in fact, um, there's some mm -hmm. very interesting uh, uh, thoughts that have been put into paper uh, by Jonathan Wells on some of the major textbook examples for, uh, for evolution uh, that get perpetuated because, and, and probably mostly innocently too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the textbook preparer was trained in this when he was a kid, and his textbook mm -hmm. preparer was trained for this when she was a kid. And so, you know, 20, uh, 40, 60 years later, the same examples are given again and again because that's the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. Well, when textbooks are prepared, they're often done by groups of people. And so there has to be a great deal of compromise. And then once the textbook is prepared, it may be two or three years before it's published and in the, tech, in the classrooms. So they're always out of date. And, and then the, you're using the textbook that was published five years ago. Yeah, or 10. In California, I think they have to update every seven years, so you're always out of date. So we're talking about <laughs> if this were to start getting into a textbook right now, it would probably take, t what, five, ten years if somebody was really pushing <laughs> it. And the fact of the matter is, most of the places that people are doing this kind of thing, nobody's really pushing this. You don't have scientists on the cutting edge sitting there and, and thinking, how can I get this into a textbook? And particularly this. Mm -hmm. You think evolutionary scientists want this in the textbook? Mm -hmm. It will raise way too many questions in those little heads. Fortunately, there are some professors here and there who do read and who do share articles that they've read with their students, and that's about the only way students can be close to being up to date. Yes. Oh, we're dealing here with a, the basic, very basic uh, problem of uh, defining science. And uh, the constant, uh, when textbooks come up for review and so on, well, we won't allow creation in the textbooks because that's not science. And uh, uh, this is, you know, a, a mantra that has been very successful. And because science is so successful, evolution rides on the success of science, the experimental success of science. As, as, uh, and so evolution must be right and so on, and it, this, this idea carries through. Uh, this is no way to find truth. You're equating science with truth here, and that's, those are two different words entirely. Or reality is not a science, per se, and so on. Science is a secular interpretation right now. It didn't used to be, but it is now. Uh, but it seems to me the, uh, what we need uh, is a broader approach to this a historical approach, right? I mean, a, a careful historical approach in our classrooms and otherwise to show how ideas dominate, ideas, uh, paradigms frame the questions you ask and they frame the answers you ask. Uh, and humanity changes ideas over a while, and you, you know they're not absolutes because they, they keep changing. Uh, I think our students need to be, need to be more aware of this, uh, and students everywhere ought to be more aware of the fact that uh, uh, what is truth today uh, can be a heresy to, tomorrow and so on, and that uh, uh, what looks like very sophisticated thinking and so on uh, is completely embraced in, the, in a paradigm lot like this today, you know, the, the whole question raised here was, you know, it, it avoided the, the basic question, are uh, 
higher apes and man. Different organisms are not, or the, the, the assumption is they evolved from each other. The whole, th whole thing is based on that one assumption there. And we don't question that. We were just impressed with the data, you know. Oh, man, uh, we need to get deeper into these, into these uh, basic questions uh, that students might be a little more critical of uh, what is going on here in human thinking. Well, it's um, <clears throat> about two minutes till uh, 11.30. What I thought I would do is say, I, I see this as a, not just a, a, some failure from the past, but an opportunity from the present. Number one, I think that uh, this particular issue should be more widely known in creationist circles. Uh, this video hopefully will make some difference in that. Number two, um, I think that we are now preparing Adventist high school biology textbooks. And this example, I think, should be in it. This particular example, and then maybe some other ones to give kids a feel for, not only the standard model, but also some of the things that put a great deal of strain on that standard model. Number three is I see this as a wonderful opportunity for research, relatively low cost research. There must be some Adventists who have enough money that they can spring some of it to sequence the Bonobo uh, 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 Y chromosome and see whether it does, in fact, match the chimp Y chromosome very closely, in which case evolution has been frozen not just for the last 100,000 years, but it's been frozen for the last million years, and in which case all of this stuff has to have taken rapidly. This is now no longer hugely expensive. Uh, it does not. Uh, it takes people who know what they're doing, but it. But it's in terms of the, oh, in terms of the laboratory costs, it's not that great. This would be a very easy thing to do. Uh, sequencing is done all over the sequence place. Sequence is cheap. And uh, sequence different bonobos from different tribes. Sequence different chimps from different tribes. Um, see whether the intraspecific variation is as low as it is in humans. If it does, I think that puts a huge strain on, on, the, on the explanation that we had rapid evolution. Um, it'd be interesting to sequence the gorilla strain. And that's cheap stuff. And you know what? You could publish it, and you could publish it without comment, other than to say, wow, this is changed, or how does this fit into the standard scenario? And you would not have to, you would not have to say. And by the way, we're creationists, and we think you guys are all wrong. You just present it, and then let them squirm. I think it should be done. Would the PA call all the human creationists? I I think he does, but whatever. Anyway, next week, come back, we'll talk about how fast DNA degenerates and the implications that has for um, DNA in uh, old material. <laughs>